All right. Thank you so much for being online with us today. We're in part nine, part nine of 2 Corinthians. And I hope you've really enjoyed this series. I have. Paul is one of my favorite writers in the Bible. Of course, he wrote most of the New Testament, but we can learn a lot from Paul. So we're in week nine, this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It's his second letter to the Corinthians, at least the ones that we have recorded in Scripture. We think there may have been some other ones, or at least scholars do. Today, I want to kind of frame what Paul's talking about a little bit. Are you familiar with the video game Mario Kart? You might be, you might not be. It's a Nintendo game. There's been several different versions throughout the year or throughout the years. And it's it's been around for I don't even know how many years, probably 10 to 15 years or longer. Um, super fun game. Love playing Mario Kart. As a matter of fact, play Mario Kart with my kids probably two or three times a week, if not more. There is a time Robbie loves to play with me more so than Micah. Marianne likes to play when she's in town. Uh, Jennifer, not so much. She gets frustrated with it, too. Uh, it's one of my favorite all-time games. But Robbie and I, for a while, we're playing every day. And Robbie now beats me really bad. But that's another story. Um, the reason that some of my family members get really frustrated with Mario Kart, it's a racing game. You're either in like little cars or go-karts or on motorcycles. You're racing these tracks. And that's well and good. You know I love racing. However, to make the game a little interesting, they give you weapons. Now, those weapons are turtle shells that you can throw at people that make them spin out. You can, um, you can throw boomerangs. Some of them, sometimes they're speed boosts. Sometimes they give you invincibility. Uh, one of my favorites and least favorites all at the same time is banana peel. You have this banana peel and you leave it behind you and whatever car runs into it, you could run into it the next time. But whatever runs into it spins out. Well, that's kind of what I'm talking about today is those banana peels. Because Paul talks about stumbling blocks. In this passage, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you want to go ahead and jump there. In Mario Kart, you're racing along, you're trying to catch up. And the person will drop a banana peel and the stumbling block slows you, spins you out and it slows you down. You lose your momentum. That's what stumbling blocks do in our lives. They're things that trip us up. They're things that cause us to slow down or lose focus. And actually, when we lose focus, that's usually when we run into these stumbling blocks. Because we're not seeing or hearing from God in those things. So in a way, stumbling blocks, if you're in Mario Kart, they help you win the race sometimes. I can't tell you how many times I've put banana peels down and I come around the next lap and hit the same banana peel I put down the, the, the lap before, but that's a whole different story. I think we do put our own stumbling blocks in our way. That's another metaphor we could use for this, but I hope you get this visual of what I'm talking about. If not, look up Mario Kart on YouTube and you can see somebody playing it. It's a lot of fun. Um, here's the thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul talks about stumbling blocks. Paul talks about things that we can sometimes put in the way of people's growth, that we can put in the way of them even coming to Christ by the way we live. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. And if you're following the notes, the first point is stumbling blocks. So you can write that in there. I give you those notes. You can look at them online and, and you can go, actually go to KennesawFamilyLifeChurch.org and download the PDF of the notes or you have them on the screen. They're not printable from, from our, uh, our web version of the service. But if not, they're there. You can get to them. I hope that you follow along with them. But let's look at verses 3 through 7 of chapter 6. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. 
We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach truth, or the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and in the left hand for defense. So unlike Mario Kart, the, the stumbling, we, the idea of Mario Kart is to cause your competitors to stumble so that you have the advantage of maybe possibly winning the race. Robbie and I have kind of like this unspoken rule. We really try not to throw any weapons at each other. Now, we are not always successful, but we, we do. We kind of have this unspoken rule. We don't do it that much. But when everybody's playing, it's kind of like game on. And there's other computers that are, there's always 12 in the race and there, you know, so there's always these other computers that are always trying to trip you up and cause you to stumble. You know, that's what the enemy does. The enemy tries to throw stumbling blocks in the way so that you will trip and stumble and get off track. So he doesn't want you to be successful in this race. So he's constantly going to be putting things in your path. Paul talks about, in this context, living in such a way that what we do as believers are not stumbling blocks for others. Sometimes the enemy doesn't have to do a thing because we do such a good job of causing others to stumble. Paul worked really hard, and you know, he was defending himself in 2 Corinthians. He worked really, really hard to make sure that he would not be that stumbling block that would keep anybody from growth or coming to Christ. So we're going to talk a little bit about how he did this and what was important. So the first thing, there's a little sub point there. And so the sub point number one is how we endure. And if you look at verses four and five, it says, In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. He says, we've been beaten, we've been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. Was Paul saying that to puff himself up? No. The reason he said those things was to show what he has endured for the gospel so that it would go out to people. And here's the thing. People, we've talked about this a lot, people are looking at our lives. We are that billboard of Christ, and so they're looking at us, and they want to know. They want to know when all hell breaks loose, how do we respond? They want to know, are we different than anybody else? Does Christ, does following Jesus offer me any peace when life is hard? See, for me, God has proved himself faithful so many times that we've endured some really hard things. We've had a couple times where we've almost lost our house and we've watched God come through and meet that need. There has been times where we've lost loved ones. There's been times where we've been hurting. Right now, Jennifer has been sick. Pastor Jennifer has been sick. She's had a broken ankle and a broken foot. In the midst of getting sick, it has been a hard time. But we can have joy and peace because we know that God is with us. How we respond to COVID speaks to the world around us about what God's doing in our lives. Now, I'm not saying about being reckless. I'm not saying anything about that. But not living in fear. Not living like the world has ended. I think it's kind of sad and it's funny to a point, but it's sad to another point. All the memes and things that have gone out about how bad 2020 is. As Christians, as believers, yeah, 2020 has had some terrible things in it, but God is still in control. So instead of, you know, we're, I know it's a joke and we're making fun of it, but why not lift people up? Why not encourage people? Let them know that God is still in control. Let them know that even though life is hard right now, even though we can't do some of the things that we really want to do, and we have to wear masks when we go in places, and I don't know very many people that really like to wear a mask,
But God has not changed. And we wear masks not out of fear, out of respect for others. Just in case maybe I do have the virus and don't know it. I'm a pretty healthy guy. I want to be respectful of those around me. So how we endure trials, how we endure hardships, speak to our faith. If we are going through trials and hardships and every time you see us, it's like, oh, woe is me. Life just sucks. It's terrible. We've, we're becoming a stumbling block to the people around us because they're looking at us and they're going, well, if they follow Jesus and life is so bad, why bother following Jesus? Why would I do that? So Paul's saying the way we endure speaks to people about who we are in Christ. And he doesn't want to cause anyone to stumble. He doesn't want the way that he lives his life to be a stumbling block to anybody. The enemy does enough of that all the time. Now, I'm going to say this. Yeah, there's going to be tough times. That doesn't mean that you're always walking around smiling. Doesn't mean that you're always like chipper and jovial and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about having a peace that in the midst of all these things that you know that God's in control so that when people see your life, they know that you're not sitting there worried, living in fear, shaking in a corner because you think everything's just going to fall apart. You truly know that God has things in control. That's really what this is about. Look, I've read this scripture many times and I'm going to read it thousands of more times in my life as long as Jesus keeps me here on this earth. But Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. First four words, don't worry about anything. That is directly in Scripture. It tells us that when we're in that place where we struggle, and we do worry at times, but Paul's saying shift that worry over to prayer. Shift that worry over to God. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. It then has a promise. It says, then you will experience God's peace. Isn't that awesome? But we live, sometimes we live with so much fear. Like, don't we realize that God has everything under control? That's why those guys could endure beatings. That's why they could endure all those things. We talked about it. They knew this life was a vapor. They knew this life isn't all there is. And they knew even if their body was broken to the point of death that they would be with Jesus. So what is there to fear? What is there to worry about? So when we live in that fear, we allow the enemy to rob us of our lives. To rob us of our joy. To rob us of living. Again, I'm not telling you to be reckless. I'm telling you to put your trust in Jesus and to not live in fear. And anxiety and those things. Think about it. Do we really trust God with our lives? If so, it's going to change the way we live. If we truly trust God with our lives, it's going to change the way we live. Because we're going to realize that God is in control. That no matter what the enemy throws against us, no matter what's happening in our lives, no matter how we feel, God is in control. 
And we have to trust that He's going to get us through whatever situation we're in. Now, fear is a natural response to certain situations. I've been in places where I have felt fear. That's not necessarily a sin. But how we respond to that fear, what we do with that fear, putting our trust in Jesus. That's when we pray harder. That's when we go, okay, God, I don't know what's going on here, but I need you. I need you to intervene. I need you to be a part of what's going on. Give me some peace right now. So it's not even really that we feel the fear that's the problem. It's what we do with it. Cast your fears on Him. Cast your fears to Jesus and allow Him to give you a peace in that moment. When we the hard things come at us, we got to go to God in prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to give us peace. His Word tells us that His peace will guard our hearts. So that when we hear those doom reports on the news, and we can, that's why when we sit and we fill our minds with all those things, we get to this place where we can get so full of gloom and doom and think that everything's just going to fall apart in the world. That we fill our minds with all that stuff and then it, it derails us. It's okay to watch the news. It's okay to be informed. But you also need to filter that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and remember that God is in control. So how we endure speaks to what we believe. James tells us that when we endure, we will have peace and joy even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of hard times. In James chapter 1. So we now have that we should endure. Now let's talk about the second part of what Paul talked about in this, this stumbling block section. is how we live. How we endure. So how we get through difficult times. Now I want to talk about how we live for just a minute. You say, well, aren't those the same thing? Well, not really. Not really. There are times where we endure stuff. But how we live our lives speak to who we are. So verses 6 and 7, we prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in in the right hand for attack and in the left hand for defense. Pretty interesting. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, the Holy Spirit and love. Kind of sounds like the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Ephesians, or not in Ephesians, in Galatians. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But those things that are in us as we follow Christ, purity of heart, to keep our lives pure, These things being evident in our lives draw others to Christ. We're like magnets because when people see us actually following the Word of God and living for God, then they want what we have. They're curious to see what's going on. They want to know what's a part of us. But see, here's the converse to that. If we call ourselves Christians, maybe we have the t-shirt, we have the bumper sticker, You know, you might even have the cool little cross tattooed on your arm, you know, whatever. We like to put all this stuff that shows we're Christians on the outside, but when we don't live it, we become that stumbling block to somebody else. So I saw somebody one time that had all the Christian bumper stickers and somebody cut them off in traffic and they're flipping the person the bird as they drive by. That's not a great Christian witness. It's not showing the purity of heart that God's called us to. I almost would rather nobody wear a Christian t-shirt unless they're going to live and follow Christ. The way we live speaks to who we are. And if we live in such a way that defames Christ by Maybe our lustful actions. 
maybe our addictive actions, maybe it's just our terrible attitude and just plain being mean. Man, I've met some mean Christians. And they've pushed a lot of people away. They've been stumbling blocks to a lot of people because they've become so self-righteous that they're so mean that nobody wants to be around them. See, but if we're drawing into God and we're getting closer to Him, those things are going to be stripped off of us. And the closer we get to Him, the anger and the bitterness and the rage and the lust and those things are going to slowly slip away. We're going to look more and more like Jesus. And the more and more we look like Jesus, the more and more people are going to be drawn to us. And if we have that stuff in our past, and if people know that we struggle with those things and we're honest about it and we confess those sins, that will also draw people in. It's not that they're waiting just for us to fail. They want to see how we're going to respond even when we do fail. But we need to live a life of purity and of holiness. Paul addresses some of these things in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, I'm going to read verses 9 through 13 for you for just a minute. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge, Eating in the temple of the idol of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against the other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what you eat causes another believer to sin, or if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Now, what was happening in that is the Corinthian area was a pagan area. There were Jews there, but the pagans would sacrifice meat to idols, and then they would sell it in the temple for food. And for some of the people, they were really did not ever want to eat meat that was offered to an idol because they didn't want to disrespect God. Now, Paul had just talked about the freedom that we have in Christ that, you know what, really eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol has no meaning for us. That we're not sinning against God because we didn't sacrifice it to the idol, but He didn't want to cause anybody to stumble, so he said, I won't even eat meat again if it's going to cause somebody to stumble. Here's us in our American way. Well, it's cool that they don't want to eat meat, but I'm going to eat meat, and I don't really care if it bothers them. So there's this tension and this balance, and I'm going to give you probably the the easiest example. Alcohol. For generations, the church preached against alcohol. It didn't really matter what denomination you were in. If you partook of alcohol, you sinned against God. The truth is that in Scripture, drinking alcohol is not a sin. Now, some of you, you might your jaw may have dropped, you may have fallen over. I'm going to give you a second to recover. But you cannot find anywhere in Scripture that says drinking alcohol is a sin. However, you will find in Scripture where being drunk is a sin. So early on in the church, in an attempt to keep people of clear mind and to be at a higher standard, they just said, hey, don't drink alcohol at all. Well, then it got turned into this thing where, well, if you drank alcohol, you were sinning against God. Then it became a legalistic thing. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you should go out 
and have a couple beers or a bottle of wine or whatever, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't. But here's what I am going to say. Drunkenness is a sin. Here's the other side of that coin. We're talking about stumbling blocks. I, in my freedom, could go and have a beer with a friend. But you know what? That beer with a friend, they see, hey, you know what? He's a pastor. He's having a beer with me, so this must be okay. And they don't have the self-control, and they indulge in alcohol to a point where they become drunk. They indulge in alcohol to a point where they become drunk and maybe hurt somebody from behind the wheel. Or maybe they have a problem with alcoholism and I just call them, cause them to stumble back into that sin. That is on me. So in my freedom, yes, I could. But I choose not to because I don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else. Actually, in the Assemblies of God, the denomination that, that, that I'm in, that we're in, they recently released, because for years it was no alcohol is a sin, they recently released a new statement that said, yes, we understand that alcohol of itself is not a sin, but drunkenness is, just like we just talked about, but as ministers in the Assemblies of God, we're asking you to hold yourself to a higher standard and not drink alcohol as a minister of the gospel. So we signed paper that said, we will not drink alcohol as a minister of the gospel. Why? Because I would rather not drink alcohol and be an example to somebody that draws them to Christ than to drink alcohol in my own freedom and cause my neighbor to sin. I hope that puts that in context for you. Sometimes there are a lot of things that we can do in our freedom with God that aren't necessarily sins, but cause other people to sin. And Scripture is very clear about causing somebody else to stumble. Actually, at one point, Jesus said, if you cause one of my children to stumble, it'd be better that you had a millstone tied around your neck and you were thrown in the bottom of the ocean than to cause somebody else to stumble. So the way we live our lives can be a stumbling block to somebody else. So I'm not saying that to say, whoa, hey, how am I supposed to live? If I do this and this, then it's going to cause these people to stumble. It goes back to the conversations we used to have with teenagers in, in youth group about, man, Guys are very visual, and some of the girls would wear clothes that were very revealing. And they were like, well, they shouldn't look at me in lust. Well, you know what? You're right. They shouldn't. That is sin in their heart. But you're also becoming a stumbling block. It goes both ways. We have a responsibility to the people around us to do everything we possibly can not to be a stumbling block to them. So does that mean that we forgo doing some things that are okay so that others can have a closer relationship with Jesus? Absolutely. It's totally worth it. Because we don't want to cause anybody else to stumble. See, if we go, well, you know what? That's on them. They've got the problem, not me. I can do this, then that's our selfishness. And you know, selfishness is the core of sin. It's saying to God, I'll do whatever I want to do. So yes, we do have freedom in Christ. I'm not saying that to make you feel like you're a terrible person. We have freedom in Christ, but we just need to use that freedom wisely because we don't want to cause anybody to stumble. We don't want to be stumbling blocks. We don't want to hinder anybody. I'm going to tell you, there are times in my life when I've been a stumbling block to some people. Unintentionally. Now, there is a scripture where Jesus said, where, where it calls Jesus a stumbling block to the Jews, and he was in the context that they didn't know what to do with him as the Messiah. That's why they ended up crucifying him. But it was necessary to bring the forgiveness that we needed. 
So stumbling blocks, we don't want anybody. We don't want to cause anybody to stumble. Point two of this message, those, that was just the first point, a couple points there, how we in, about being a stumbling block and how we endure and how we live can be stumbling blocks to people. Or they can be things that draw people to Christ. The second thing is we need to be steadfast. So we have stumbling block and steadfast. What does it mean to be steadfast? I know that's a weird word. Quite honestly, I wanted it to be alliterated. So I use steadfast. Or we could be an anchor. I want you to see where this is. 2 Corinthians 6, 8 through 10. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or whether they praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, yet we have everything. And really, I took the steadfast from this first line. We serve, pe- we serve God whether people honor us or despise us. Paul's saying, look, truth is, I want you to like me. I want you to be happy about me as a leader. I want you to, to enjoy my leadership. Remember, he wrote this letter with correction. But at the end of the day, he's going to serve God whether people like him or not whether people agree with them or not. There were people in the church in Corinth that were saying all kinds of things about Paul, how he was a weak leader, how he didn't follow his word, he didn't do all these things, when Paul was just being consistent in following God. And whether people liked him or whether they didn't, he had to be consistent. He had to be steadfast no matter what, to stand firm. That's what it means to be stand firm. You could use anchor, to be anchored in the Word of God, to be anchored into the things of God, so that no matter what happens, we don't change. We're firm in our relationship with Him. We must stand firm in what we believe, and we must be steadfast. See, that's the big thing. If we're not standing firm, if we're not steadfast, then we are going to be stumbling blocks to people because what we say is going to be different than what we do. We're going to tell you, man, you need to live this way, and then we're going to go out and do exactly the opposite. That's not standing firm. Or if we say, hey, you need to follow Jesus and all these things, and then the one bad thing comes and we flip the script and go somewhere else and do something else, that's not standing firm. That's being waving or wavering and being tossed around. We've got to stand firm on the will of God. Stand firm on the word of God. Stand firm in his Holy Spirit. Be anchored there. We can't waver on that one thing. I don't care who's in political office. Well, I do care who's in political office. Let me back up. But no matter who's in political office, it doesn't change how I follow Jesus. It doesn't change my trust in God. So whether you're Democrat or Republican, I have personal beliefs in those areas, but they they are centered on my relationship with God. And no matter who's voted into that office, my world does not end. The church does not end. There is absolutely nothing this country can do to destroy the church. I don't care if they make it illegal. I don't care if they make it illegal to worship God. They cannot destroy the church. It's been proven throughout history that when the church has tried to be stomped out, it will grow. Because my following Jesus, true followers of Jesus, has absolutely nothing to do with the political climate of this world. 
has absolutely nothing to do with COVID-19, has absolutely nothing to do with all of the stuff that's going around in the world right now because my relationship with God is my foundation. I stand firm in that. Now, I can respond to those things and I can pray about those things and I can actively participate in those things, but my relationship with God is foundational. So I'm not going to argue with you about politics. I'll give you my opinion if we have a private conversation, but I will not talk about it from this pulpit. I will tell you to vote. I, should, I will tell you to pray before you vote and to think really hard about the direction that God has for our country. But no matter who's put in that office, God does not change. So I don't care if all hell breaks loose in our country. God does not change. I'm going to follow Him no matter what. The problem is, is that when things don't happen the way we want them to, then we're like, oh, God doesn't care about me anymore. Oh, everything's out of control. I don't know what I'm going to do. God does not change. We have to stand firm in that. Ephesians 4.14 says this, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Because we know the Word of God. We know Scripture. That's why it's so important to read the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, how can you expect to stand firm? I want to challenge you to read through the Bible, cover to cover. If you've never done it, read every book in the Bible. Now, you don't have to read it from Genesis to Revelation in a row because it's not written that way. But you can go on the U version, you can get a plan, and it will help you to go there. It will help you to do it. Read through Scripture. Know what's there. If you don't understand something, that's okay. If you don't understand something, that's okay. Read the Bible. And if you don't understand something, ask somebody that's been a Christian for a long time. You know what? I don't know everything about the Bible. I've been a Christian for over 25 years. But I can study and learn. I can dig and find. So ask me. Ask other people in the church. That's why it's important to be connected to the church. Be careful with Google. Yes, Google can give you a lot of information, but Google can also give you a lot of information that isn't accurate. It always has to line up with Scripture and be consistent with the character of Christ. We don't want to waver. We don't want to be blown around. We want to be firm and steadfast in our relationship with God. And when we're firm and steadfast, we're not going to be stumbling blocks to the people around us, not to those that are looking at us and saying, oh, this is how a Christian wants to live. Now, we might be a stumbling block to somebody that's trying to sin. But I don't want to cause anybody not to come to Christ. And the only way I know how to do that is to live for God the best I can, 100%. I'm not always great at it. I fail a lot. But that's my goal. I can't live my life without Him. That's why it's so important to have this word in my life. It drives me. Let me wrap this up. We must live our lives in such a way that we don't become stumbling blocks for those around us. It's super important. 
We want to draw people closer to God. We don't want to cause them to stumble. That's why we need to allow the fruit of the Spirit to develop in our lives. So I wanted to read Galatians 5, and 23. If you want to know how our lives need to grow, this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul goes on to say there's no law against these things. The closer we get to God, the more that fruit's going to develop in our lives. You might be saying, well, I don't have some of those things. That's okay. We all have more of some fruit than others. Some of us have a really hard time loving certain people. That's why we're doing the study on Sunday nights, everybody always. It's about loving everybody. If you haven't had a chance to be on there and hear Bob Goff, the guy's a nutcase. But he's about loving everybody. To have joy. Sometimes joy is hard to have. And you go through some really bad things and it's hard to have joy. The closer we get to God, we learn that peace and it brings that joy in our lives. Peace and patience. Man, they tell you not to pray for patience because that's when you're going to get tested. But we need to have that patience and the kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And you realize that it ends with self-control. That's the the key. You have love at the beginning and self-control at the end. Those two bookmarks help us with all the rest. That's what needs to be growing in our lives. That's what needs to be developing in our lives. And the closer we get to Jesus, that's what we're going to see. I'm not saying this to be legalistic, but I am saying this to say our goal isn't to see just to get the ticket into heaven. Our goal is to become like Jesus and to develop this fruit in our lives, to develop these things in our lives. That's the goal, to be like Him. The second thing is we just need to stand firm in what we believe. We can only do this by growing our relationship with God every day. You have to nurture and grow the relationship. So, Paul used a lot of farming references because much of the economy was based in farming. So when he talked about growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, it was something that farmers could understand. The only way we can get closer to God is if we nurture and grow that relationship, spending time in His Word, spending time with other believers, spending time in prayer. The more you do these things, the longer you do these things, the more and more you're going to look like Him. The beauty is, I know most of you. Most of you that watch this, there may be a few of you on here that I don't know well. I see some of this fruit in your lives. And there's some people that just have joy. I can think of a couple names right off the top of my head. Jocelyn always seems to be a joyful person. Mary seems to be a joyful person. Kindness, man. I can think of Rob and Heather excel in kindness. Faithfulness. And Alan, one of the most faithful people I know. And no, I'm not going to list everybody in the church. I'm listing some names though. Why? Because these are things I see. Jane shows love. could go on and on. Do we all have all of those fruit just flowing out of us? Sometimes, but not always. So I want to get closer to Him. I want to learn how to love the way Jesus loved. I want to learn to treat people the way Jesus treated people. Sometimes Jesus had to speak some really hard things in love.
So where are you today? If you're not a believer, man, come to him today. Let him give you that joy and that peace. I hope that my life and the lives of those that are in our church are what draws you to him. If we don't even know you, maybe you just stumbled across our service through Facebook or whatever. Maybe somebody invited you. The Holy Spirit's who draws you here. If you have a relationship with God, then we have a responsibility to live our lives in such a way with righteousness and holiness and purity. To live in such a way that we don't cause others to stumble. We're all running this race, as Paul said, but we shouldn't be throwing the weapons at everybody. The enemy's going to throw enough as it is. We should be encouraging each other along this journey. We need each other more than ever before. Pandemics cannot separate us from each other, cannot separate us from the love of God. We may not always be able to meet in person, but we can text, we can call, we can get on Zoom. We can show love to each other. We can show that we care. I love each one of you. Let me pray over you right now. Father, I pray that this message hits home, that it makes sense. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness for times when I've been stumbling blocks to other people. Fortunately, I know I have been. And Lord, I pray you forgive me for that. And I pray that you help me to live my life after you. That I would be willing to do whatever it takes to draw others to you. That I would be anchored in your word today. And I ask that everybody that's watching this and praying with me right now, that they would be anchored in your word, that they'd be anchored in your peace, that they'd be filled with your Holy Spirit. If anyone's watching and they don't know you, Lord, I pray that they would come to you and just confess their brokenness and their sin to you today so that they can be forgiven and washed clean by you. They can have that joy and that peace. No one comes to you except through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit flows out of this no matter when it's played. Father, I pray that you would change us and mold us into your image. Help us to live lives that draw people to you and are not stumbling blocks. And we give you all praise, honor, and glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've not had a chance to pray or if you'd like to pray with somebody, you can just click the button on the screen for prayer and it will pop up a separate private chat and one of our hosts will pray with you. I want to thank you for being on here today. Have an amazing week.